hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. You spell that? That's right. Mountain Gazette 201 is fresh off the press. It's being packaged right now as you listen to this. For real, it's actually being packaged. And if you go to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe, you have until April 29th to subscribe and get 201. After that, there's no telling if you're going to get this or not. So you better head over there now. I do love the smell of print. Now, folks, kick back, relax, sip that coffee, and enjoy the show. The latest release from commercial type, Ionic Modern. It's the perfect typeface for editorial projects in print and on screen. Available to see and test at commercialtype.com. Here in the Green Mountains of Vermont, we print magazines. We're Lane Press and we've been doing this since 1904. We don't print books, journals, or signs, just magazines. All of our equipment is made for that, and all of our craftspeople specialize in it. We print for prestigious colleges and universities, for business-to-business brands. We print regional, association, niche, and newsstand titles. And we would love to print your magazine. To learn more, visit us at lanepress.com. What I care most about with The New Yorker is what's in it, what's on it, what's said, how it's said how it's edited, how it's written. If somebody chooses to consume it, to read it, to love it in print, in digital, in both, I'm happy. That's the most important thing. What I want to do is make the best possible New Yorker and see the New Yorker thrive long past me. And it's an absolute privilege to serve that cause because that's what I think it is, cause. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. I'm George Gendron. I want you to stop what you're doing for just a moment and imagine we're back in 1998. Those of you born since then will have to use your imagination. We're on an Ask Me panel exploring the future of magazines in the digital age. The moderator, eager to get the discussion off to a lively start, turns to you and asks, what magazine that we all cherish today is least likely to adapt and survive what's coming? And without hesitation, you blurt out, The New Yorker. The audience murmurs in agreement. The Atlantic, someone shouts from the audience. More murmuring. I'm not surprised, and neither is anybody else in the room. It's almost three decades ago, and yet we're already headed into a new world of nugget media and the total loss of our collective attention spans. Hell, magazines that feature 25,000-word polemics on topics like the squirrels of Central Park are already dinosaurs, even here in 1998. It's a bleak outlook for an institution, and I'm talking about The New Yorker, that claims the following heritage. It has survived two world wars and the Great Depression. It's been led by only five editors ever in its 71-year history. It didn't use color or photography until its 67th year when a young, supremely talented and controversial Brit took over in 1992. And it's now run by a former newsman who had never edited anything except his high school newspaper. But here's the thing, it's 2024 and we're looking at a decimated magazine business. Mighty brands and hot shit startups alike are dead and gone or running on fumes. The big publishers are divesting from print, right and left, and yet there is a shining light. Today, The New Yorker is preparing for its 100th anniversary with that same newsman at the top of the masthead who has brought video, events, podcasts, print, a magazine, and even some branded pajamas together with the most legacy of legacy brands to create a 21st century media juggernaut programming note. This is our season four finale. On behalf of myself and our entire team, thank you for listening and for your passion for print. And now, let's meet David Remnick. I want to start with the most important question of all, which is, you grew up in Jersey. What exit? I grew up in Bergen County. It's like northern Springsteen Lane. What can I say? Me too. 165, man. You were at Hillsdale. Hillsdale, that's right. I was in Milford and Oradell. Oh, very nice. Very nice. 
You went to high school at Pascack Valley High. I did. I went I to did. Bergen Catholic. Oh, you were far superior to us athletically, that's for sure. Bergen Catholic, the rare times we'd play that we'd get our backsides kicked. And yet you were regional school, so there's no excuse for that. Regional school is a fancy word for we drew from two towns. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so just to come to closure about our common Jersey roots, just how much of your professional success do you attribute to having grown up in Jersey? It's nice of you to say it's professional success. I don't know what to say to that. What are the characteristics that are characteristically Jersey? Tenacious, scrappy. I think for me, it, 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 in, in all seriousness, what characterized it is its proximity to and its distance from New York City. In other words, it was a million miles away and 25 minutes away. And I, I wanted to bridge that 25 minutes and million miles as quickly as possible and had my ear on and my eye on that place always. And, and now at the age of 64, when my feet hit the sidewalk in the morning, I feel like somebody in a 40s musical. I want to click my heels. I, I, re I really mean it. I, I love this city. No, I know exactly what you mean. I, I moved from New York in 75, and I still miss it. I still miss it in a way that's extraordinary. So I'm going to stick with Jersey, not as the location, but as a period in your life. So you're very young, and I've heard you somewhere talk about kind of your... I think your infatuation with magazines, and I'm assuming you were talking about Esquire and Rolling Stone, maybe not the New Yorker, unless you were one of those savants that used to read the New Yorker with a flashlight under your covers. I absolutely was not. And I came to magazines because we had a lot of them in the house. My father had a, I don't know how to put this, extremely modest dental practice, and his office was attached to the house. And so I would, at night or on the weekends, I would sneak through the basement and into his office and lay on the floor of the waiting room on the linoleum tiles and read Highlights magazine or things like right. that. Once I grew older, I was completely taken up with what well, was a cool magazine. Time and Newsweek seemed awfully dull. But as I got a little older, the, the magazines that really knocked me flat were Esquire magazine and Rolling Stone for obvious reasons. Counterculture was the news and Rolling Stone had invented itself is the news of that culture, which seems so far away and so tantalizing at the same time. And it was publishing all kinds of people as what Esquire. And that just was not what was in the New York Times. That wasn't what was in Time and Newsweek. And it was really formative. The New Yorker was there too, but I didn't know how to read it, which is to say, I didn't know how to understand it. It seemed like something from Greenwich, Connecticut. Princeton, New Jersey, which was two places I knew nothing about. It seemed distant. Yeah. It seemed very grown up to me. Very grown up. Yeah. And it, it didn't have its feet firmly planted in the church of what's happening now or what I thought to be the church of what's happening right. now. It had on its cover bowls of fruit and abandoned summer houses. It, it was not a language I knew quite how to cope with. Although you still have bowls of fruit and summer houses on your covers. <laughs> very often. I'm kidding. Very often. We'll get to that in a minute. Sure. It's funny you say, okay, I'm reading highlights, but at the same time, you were also obsessed with Dylan's I Want You, a song that was about nothing but lust. Yeah, it was the first album I ever bought that I ever spent my two ninety nine at EJ Corvettes. It was something called The Best of 66, one of those compilations, and it had really corny groups like Chad and Jeremy and Paul Revere and the Raiders, and it had this song on it, I Want You by Bob Dylan. And it sounded different than anything else. And he sounded different than anything else. And the lyrics were different than anything else I'd ever heard, that anybody had ever heard. And of course, I didn't know completely what to make of it. I didn't know what to make of its emotions, physical and emotional, but it just hit home. And I became, over time, so obsessed with him and his work and his music and his lyrics and anything or almost anything good that I bumped into until I was 15, 16 years old, came through the good offices of Bob Dill. He would mention Cisco. He would just mention American mythology, or he'd make a historical reference or a musical reference, and I would go seek it out. He'd mention Allen Ginsberg. I'd go to a church basement and buy for 10 cents a copy of Owl. Or he'd mention some seemingly obscure bluesman, and I'd find the album. He was like the hub of the wheel, culturally. And when I look back on it, he was, you know, younger than 30 years old. He was retired the first time when he was 25. 
which is such a weird thing to conjure when you know I'm 64 years old for God's sake, and and it's it's just what an amazing figure he is, and he's coming to New York next month to play. 82 years old. You gonna go hear him? What else would I do? You know, you're describing this notion of the hub. I don't want to get off on a tangent about this because I could turn the, our whole podcast into a conversation about this. But it's really about how people really learn. Not school learning, but it's about how people learn. Well, look, I, I, eventually I, I am grateful to, to teachers that I had in high school and in college and learned a hell of a lot. But the thrill of finding things on your own and by suggestion and through the radio and through your record player and what's in the air has its own tantalizing thrill. I noticed with my own kids, something that I've decided is a law. And the law is the following. Somewhere along the line, you have little kids and you play the Beatles for them and they love it. And as parents, you become intoxicated and you think the next thing I'm going to play for them, they're going to love that too. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. (laughs) All little kids like the Beatles. It's melodic. It's magical. And then you play something else that you think they're going to like and they just, they don't want to hear about it. They, They want to find their things on their own. And also they have to drive you crazy. Their job is to push away their parents, not to invite every every taste and auspices of their parents. I think another of what you're talking about, though, whether it's your kids and Beatles as a point of departure or whether it's Dylan for you, is it encourages and builds and nurtures curiosity. As I've gotten older and I've still followed that career, it's very obvious that, and I don't think this is an original thought, but it just is, that Bob Dylan himself is a magpie, that his lyrics, his style, his thinking, his work is the result of all the things that went into his ears, not only when he was very young, but starting with that. And he was listening to 50,000 watt radio stations while he was a kid in hippie Minnesota. And he was hearing blues. He was hearing hillbilly music. He was hearing first generation rock and roll. And that thrilled him so that he found himself on a stage in, in his high school at hippie playing a little Richard song in order to drive the principal crazy and for them to prematurely shut the show down. And then he starts reading things, poetry, the Bible, novels, watches movies, and it shows up in his work. He was a magpie. The voice is a, is the result of, of, a, of a kind of magpie influence. And then it becomes him. This is the story of American culture in large part. Look at Muhammad Ali. How did some kid from Louisville, Kentucky, from segregated Louisville, Kentucky, become that personality? Sugar Ray Robinson, Gorgeous George, street corner preachers, the nation of Islam. We're all that. We're the sum of our influences and then something magical happens if somebody has some originality. Now, there was a certain point in your life where you talk about wanting to be a novelist. And then due to, I think it was both your parents' health issues, you felt that you should go out and earn earn a living, a more routine income. And so you decide. It just shows what a limited imagination I have. The idea that the way to earn a living was to be a journalist. I was about to say, you're the only journalist I've ever talked to who said, I I went to journalism to make money. Usually you go to Wall Street to make money. (laughs) And and of course I do because I've been crazy lucky, but it's not the first couch cushion you'd look under. And when I went to college, so I went to a fancy college, right? And it was the first generation where people became investment bankers and became automatically rich. It's not because they invented anything. It's not because they became the CEO of some company. They became automatically rich if they worked hard enough and stuck around at Goldman Sachs or Morgan. And I didn't know what an investment bank was when I was in college. I thought investment banks were where you went with a a little book and it had your savings in it and you took out 50 bucks. I didn't know what that was. But that was the first generation of deregulation, Reagan era, and we all found out pretty quickly. So- you get out of this fancy school as an undergraduate, and somehow you miraculously get a job as a beat reporter at the Washington Post. How in God's name did you do that? It was a different era. It was an era of expansion, not of contraction. The Washington Post was running very high post-Watergate in the late 70s, and they were hiring, and not very diverse, but they were looking for bright young people to be reporters and editors and the rest. And I was an intern there twice and finally stuck around as a night police reporter. Not a very glamorous job, but I learned a lot. And if I was looking for money, well, hey, I, th- I believe it was 14500 bucks in 1980. But on the other hand, my rent was only 350 bucks. So I was a very happy boy. I had a similar experience. I got out of school in 1973 and 
got a job at New York Magazine, and I recently found a pay stub. And I think they weren't even paying me the minimum wage. I think I was making less than $6,000 a year. Now I'm yeah. older than you. But at any rate, yeah, same thing, expansion. And New York was a, a startup. There's always more work than there were people. The Post was the hot shit newspaper because of Watergate, because of Ben Bradley and Woodward and Bernstein and all the president's men. And to be in that room promised to be something extraordinarily exciting. And despite the fact that I arrived just after the scandal, the plagiarism scandal, the Janet Cook scandal, caused a certain temporary depression in the newsroom, it really was a, an extraordinary place to be. I don't doubt that it is now, but it was thrilling. And after some bumping around, I ended up in something called the style section, which was the section of the newspaper that was meant to, in some ways, imitate or draw from the kind of things that you were seeing in Rolling Stone and an Esquire. There was a great deal of freedom and maybe some more length. And the guardrails were down a little bit in terms of voice for a newspaper. And I enjoyed that immensely. And then I got the break of a lifetime. In the 80s, I was sent to Moscow as the second correspondent, the junior guy in the bureau. And the timing was such in 1988 that the world was breaking up. And I could have written 10 articles a day and they would have published them all. The, the interest was amazing. This was the period of Gorbachev, of course. Did you overlap at all with Celestine Boland? Yeah, I did. I replaced Celestine Boland. We overlapped for about two weeks. She was very kind to me and showed me a few ropes and then off she went home. And I worked with a guy for a little while named Gary Lee. And then he was replaced with someone named Michael Dobbs, who I became very close to, and his family. And we worked together for the better part of four years. Celestine was extraordinary. Still is. But I want to go back to what you were talking about, which is probably people know this intellectually, young people, but I'm not sure they really appreciate the kind of glamour that was associated with the post around this period, post-Watergate. Well, that glamour emanated largely from its editor, Ben Bradley, who was this combination of a ship captain and Humphrey Bogart. And he was fabulous looking old wasp who wore Turnbull and Asser shirts and could curse like a sailor and had been the best friend of John Kennedy, which in retrospect was probably a bad idea for a journalist, right. and who basically built the modern Washington Post, first by building the newsroom together with Catherine Graham and her money, and then joining on to the Pentagon Papers publication, and then emphatically with Watergate. He was a fearless, charismatic figure, and there have been some terrific editors ever since, but no one had the same sort of swagger and yeah. presence in a kind of cinematic way as Ben Bradley. Look at Marty Barrett, who just finished the Washington Post about a year ago. An unbelievable career, you know, with the Boston Globe, with the New York Times, and finally with the Washington Post, but not the same kind of personality. You, you know, if, if you see him in that movie about the Boston Globe. Spotlight. Spotlight. And the Lip Schreiber gets Marty Barron pretty much on the nose. He's kind of an anti-personality. He's the sum of his judgment and steadiness. Ben Bradley, even Jason Robards could not match the charisma of the guy he was playing in Old Presidents. It was thrilling. And he was succeeded by somebody named Len Downey, who was less charismatic, but had all the you know, strength and principle that Bradley had embodied. I, I admire Len Downey very much, both as an editor and as somebody who had to carry that burden of succeeding someone who was like a comet. Well, Bradley looked like he stepped out of a 40s movie, for God's sakes. He was a 40s movie. <laughs> somebody told me a story about you. I forget who it was. It might have been one of Ben Bradley's successors about you and your wife going to the Hamptons. I'll tell you the story. I know what you're referring to. I'm married to a, a woman named Esther Fine. I mean, we've been married for well over 30 years and luckiest thing in my life and had been in the same room with my wife, with Esther and Ben Bradley, who was then well into his 80s. And we were then in our 40s. And I was absolutely sure that if Ben Bradley had lifted an eyebrow and gestured for Esther to go off with him to Morocco or Kalamazoo, off Esther would have gone. Okay, that really sums that one up. And I would not have blamed her. I would not have blamed her for a moment. Such was his charisma. I feel journalistically about Clay Felker at New York Magazine the way yeah. you do about Ben Bradley, but Clay was never a threat when it came to my marriage. <laughs> well, it was quite a stressor. One thing you say about Bradley that is really interesting is you refer to 
it has the deep, dark secret that Bradley exemplified about the sheer fun of journalism, adult fun, and how Bradley just radiated the adventure of it all. I think at one point, maybe you're talking to Alec Baldwin and you say, he was driven. He was driven out of his seat by the story. He was insatiable in wanting to know what was going on. You know, he exemplified that human desire to know, to be inside, to know what so-and-so was like, to know what was going to happen next, to know the secret behind the facade. And at the same time, it was fun. In today's world, there's no question why hide it. The media business all across the board is a struggle, a business struggle, all kinds of bad weather systems are flying in your face, whether it's the change in the advertising business or increased competition for subscriptions or now AI or the social media companies changing their algorithm and screwing all of us suddenly. It's tough. And so you're constantly in meetings and you're on Zoom and somebody will say, do you mind if I share my screen? And suddenly you're looking at a 40 slide presentation of just numbers and I try to imagine Ben Bradley, and, and it's necessary, by the way. It's necessary. If you don't get that right, there's not going to be a lot of journalism. So I try to imagine Ben in the world of Zoom and endless business meetings and acronyms and the use of the word content. I don't think it would have gone well. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Mag Culture. Read our online journal, listen to our podcast, and visit our shop to discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. Adam Moss and I not long ago had a conversation where we said that if we had been born Trustafarians, which we decidedly are not. Rich kids. Rich kids. We would have paid to do the work of editing a magazine. Since I'm still employed in doing that, I don't want to give my overlords any ideas, so I'll, I'll have a no comment for you on that. <laughs> okay. Is it still fun for you with a New Yorker in this way? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, my God. It's just not every minute of every day is fun. Of course not. It wasn't ever, really. No. And it's and there's a very big distinction to be drawn between editing and being a reporter, being a writer. So those two activities are maybe they're joined at the hip, but they certainly don't overlap. When you're an editor, your concerns are across the board. They're with the enterprise, they're with individuals, they're with groups, they're with economic concerns as well as literary and journalistic ones. It's a whole cast of things that can go terribly wrong or right in a given day. And it's not just about you. Whereas the writer, writers get knocked for being ego-driven, but of course they are. It's their thing. They're performing in public. That's a very difficult thing to do. And I don't blame the individual writers for not knowing every little detail of the whole business. Why should they have to do that? If they want to know, I'll tell them. And God knows there's a lot of writing about it, press and so on. But they have very different activities. And I've tried with minimal success, only minimal success, George, to do writing while doing this job. And I have the illusion, and it's only an illusion, that one day when I am not doing this job, I'll have a whole new lifetime to have fuller life as a writer, but I'm told, I read it in the Bible and I read it in the newspaper that I'm not going to live for it. None of us. I made my choice at a certain point in about 12 seconds. And I was offered this job. Cy Newhouse said, I want to announce it in half an hour. I said, do I get to make a phone call? It was like getting arrested. He said, yeah. <laughs> and I decided, and, and the decision was this, if I had been Philip Roth or Tony Morrison, or in other words, a writer of of, of real consequence, I wouldn't have taken this job in a million years. I just thought that I could make a contribution as an editor of The New Yorker, which had its established reputation and way of doing things and all the rest that I believed in, that I might be able to make an impact for the good. David, as long as you bring this up, it doesn't happen every day that someone who hasn't really ever been an editor becomes an editor-in-chief, not to mention the editor-in-chief, the fifth editor-in-chief of the freaking New Yorker. Yeah, and that's a fair point. Could you explain, could you pull back the curtain? How did that happen? Yeah, no, I'll tell you, look, you invite me on, I, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'll answer your questions the best I can. So you're right. I had been at the Washington Post for 10 years, and then I got an offer when Tina Brown came to edit the New Yorker 
to come write for her. I'd written one piece for her, two pieces actually for, for her Vanity Fair, one which ran and one which didn't. So that's not a very good percentage, 50-50. But anyway, I came and at the New Yorker, I was thrilled. I didn't think anything would match Moscow. Four years in Moscow for the Washington Post, but there were apples and oranges, but I, I, loved, I loved being a writer that New Yorker from 1992 to 98. And then one fine day, Tina quit, and she went off to start Talk Magazine. And that put Cy Newhouse in an unaccustomed position. Normally, he decides when somebody leaves. In other words, he fires yeah. or somebody retires. Yeah. And there was no editor of The New Yorker. And he had to come up with an answer very quickly. And I think he had a discussion with Graydon Carter. Graydon Carter wanted to stay put at Vanity Fair. It suited his just it, it suited him better, according to him. Fine. And other people were interviewed, and I got called over to Cy Newhouse's office, the late Cy Newhouse, who owned all of Condé Nast, the company that owns our magazine, as well as many other things. A billionaire, art collector, very cultivated person, very quiet person. And I was called to his office to be interviewed, and I didn't know what it was about. I thought maybe he wanted to hear from a writer to get an insight on the office, and maybe they had a suggestion. But certainly, I didn't think he'd be insane enough to even consider a 39-year-old writer who had never edited anything other than his high school newspaper, and not very well done. And we had one discussion, and it was pretty fuzzy, and that was fine. And then the next day, I was called back to the office. It was a Friday in July, very hot day, 1998. We had a slightly more direct conversation. What would I do if I were editing? But enough the pennies started dropping. Is he thinking about me? What is this? And I wasn't entirely comfortable with that conversation. And so almost as a way to put an end to it after an hour or so, I said, why don't I write a memo for you over the weekend? Okay. Mumble, mumble. And we left. Little did I know that he was also talking with an amazing editor named Michael Kinsley, who had edited Harper's, who had edited the New Republic twice, and with great distinction, an extraordinary short form writer, essayist, political thinker, and editor of the New Republic in the 80s. At, at its real zenith, you could argue with this, that, or the other thing about it, and there's another discussion, but an extraordinary journal that had taken on the job of starting Slate, which was the first high-powered internet magazine of its time. So he was living in Seattle near Microsoft, which owned it. And Kinsley flew in on Saturday and met with, and I'm only telling you this because he's told the story and I believe him. Michael came in and spoke with Newhouse on Saturday, and they came to an agreement, a tentative agreement that Michael would become the next editor of The New Yorker. And I'm here to tell you, if that had been the case, I would have been perfectly happy. Michael Kinsley is a you know, person of real substance. And the next day, there was a dinner with the Newhouses, that generation of the Newhouses, and Michael Kinsley. And after the dinner, Michael came back to his hotel room to get a message from Cy Newhouse that he had changed his mind. Wow. That he decided not to go forward with it. I do not know why. Whether it had to do with some vibe he got about him editorially or personally, or subsequently we learned that Michael's health was not good. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure that even Michael knows why. And Michael's still very much alive and, and well. Well, he's, he's got Parkinson's, but he's he's very much around. Married to a woman named Patty Stonecipher, who's been the CEO of the Washington Post lately. Yeah, and I knew nothing about this. And then the next morning, I get a phone call from the late Steve Florio, who very decorously said, come over to Cy's office and don't fuck it up. Wow, don't you love that? I was literally getting my hair cut when he called me. So I came over and, and so there was Cy Newhouse, and he offered me the job. And he said, I want to announce this in an hour. And I called my wife and she said, if you hate it after a year or two, you can always quit and go back to writing. And that was 25 years ago. That's the story, George. <laughs> what can I tell you? That's a great story. I never heard that before. I don't make any secret of it. And I tell it only because it gives an indication that how different it is from the New York Times. The New York Times is a real institution and in that people go up the ladder and there's competition and there are rivals and all this kind of thing. Here, that, there was nothing of the kind. There was an editor. There was no thought to her having a successor because she'd only been the editor for five or six years. The New Yorker had been through a succession crisis when William Sean, as brilliant as he was, had a very hard time dealing with the notion of life after him. And he was put out by Newhouse when Sean was about 79 and replaced by Bob Gottlieb. And Bob Gottlieb did the job for six years and, and that ended. And Tina was brought in. So nobody really expected this. Tina kind of caught everybody by surprise. At least she caught me by surprise. And I, I got along great with her and still do. We'll be right back. 
Print is Dead is made possible by the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence, and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. I'm curious now, having told that story, what were the advantages of never having been an editor and taking over a magazine? None. <laughs> None. Okay. <laughs> None. I can't think of one. I didn't know how to run an institution. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to organize the place. Traditionally, people that somebody like Adam Moss say when he went from the New York Times Magazine to New York Magazine, he had his people. He had experience. He had a circle of trusted senior editors or money people, whatever. I had goodwill. I worked in the office five days a week. There was a time when people did such a thing. And so I knew people at the New Yorker and I had their goodwill and they brought me along like a toddler. Well, I was about to espouse my theory of the competitive advantage of ignorance, but forget that. <laughs> no, no, it's too, it's too much the big leagues for there to be a competitive advantage of ignorance. Okay. I want to move ahead, but I have to ask a question that any listener is going to be thinking right now, which is, what was the staff reaction when you were named editor? We know what it was when Tina Brown was named editor. Did anybody threaten to quit? Well, we know what it, you, I think if you're implying that it was negative when Tina became editor, that's not true. It was mixed. There were some older writers, particularly of a kind of middle, older generation that rebelled, that were not happy. And then a lot of people had, were... Wait, let's wait and see. Had the decency to be that. I think there was some reaction that was just purely sexist, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think some were alarmed because she was a quote unquote outsider. You know, the New Yorker risks over time being a, a, a too insular place. And I think somebody coming in from the outside, from a magazine deemed by some to be excessively flashy or Hollywood or something like that, yeah. didn't take her seriously. As an, but as an editorial intelligence, I'm here to tell you that Tina Brown is really special. And she broke some crockery, but she also intended to break some crockery. And I think some crockery needed breaking too. And she made my life, I'll be very frank, easier because the New Yorker had in some ways ossified. There were a lot of people around who were only nominally writers because they weren't really writing. And it was both a difficult thing on a human level and an economic level to shift the staff to re revive it. Right. And when you do that, you hurt feelings and you, the drama ensues and not everybody you hire works out to be is what you had hoped. And there's a lot going on. And somebody like Garrison Keillor dumped on Tina from a high height before she published 10 issues. I didn't think that was fair. Well, there were people dumping on her before she ever published anything. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So now I want to fast forward here in the interest of time. And today you preside over a New Yorker that includes print, the site, uh, the New Yorker Radio Hour, video and short film, the New Yorker Festival, the shop. If you want a New Yorker t-shirt, I'm your guy to come to. I'm going to ask a question that a dear friend of mine asked me to ask, I'm definitely not going to identify her. Do you sleep in New Yorker PJs from the shop? I do not. Okay. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, you have a softball team. Of course we have a softball team. And I promised Gloria Steinem I would ask this. Is the team any good? And who dominates the league these days? You, you could promise Gloria Steinem. You, I don't know that we've played Miz. I don't go to all the games by any stretch of the imagination. We did at New York Magazine. I was on the softball team and we got our butts kicked by the Miz team. Can I tell you who the best team consistently year after year in the last 20 years has been? High times. High times. And believe me, they came as advertised. I mean, the wheat smoke that was coming from the other side of the field was impressive. And yet they smoke the ball. And we, I, 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 I don't think the New Yorker was alone. We always lost to that 15 to 2. That's because they were relaxed out there. They were, exactly, exactly. I, I asked Gloria. I give them credit. I give them credit. Unlike High Times, I said, did Ms. Magazine's softball team have a secret superpower? And she said, yeah, of course we did. And I said, what? And she said, Bella Abzug on third base. I would pay big money to see Bella Absick at 30. Uh, me too. Evidently, yeah. she was an extraordinary athlete. Yeah. So you have this incredible variety of offerings, and yet 
in a wonderful conversation you did with Alec Baldwin, he says to you at one point, he's talking about editing. And he's, well, you don't, when you're working with young writers, you don't do line editing and worry about the right adjective and adverb. Well, I'm, I'm line editing right now a very young writer, John McPhee, who has a piece in the magazine week after that. Boy, does he need help. <laughs> oh, my God, what a mess he is. Thank God I'm here to rescue him from his egregious mistakes. But then you say to Alec, you say, yeah, of course I do. Everything matters. No, but here's the thing. But but that is exceptional. I, I, I read everything, not everything that goes right online. I want to be accurate here. You know, because the volume of what we publish is much greater than it was when we were only doing a print magazine, there are things that go online before I read them. But I've had to learn to be a trusting soul. Do you have a newsroom? Michael Luo and Monica Rasick and many more who run the website, we're mushed together. It's not like the website is in North Dakota and the print is in South Dakota. It's increasingly well integrated, and that'll only increase more with time, short period of time. I read everything. Do I single-handedly close a lot of pieces during the course of the year? No, I don't. But do you still pick the cartoons? I do. The way that works is Emma Allen is the cartoon editor. She and a couple other people read hundreds of rough sketches uh, a week. She whittles it down to about, I don't know, 50. And then sometime in midweek, we have an hour-long meeting or so in which we go through those 50 and we get to about 20. So I'm the decider from going from the 50 to the 20. But she's sitting there with me and I ask her advice and she, you know, puts her thumb on the on the, on the scale and, and she's terrific to work with. What's your favorite cartoon during your tenure? Or, should, or is that impolitic to ask? It's extremely impolitic. It is like, um, George, who is your favorite child? Yeah, I do have one, but I've just never said. I mean, I have favorite New Yorker pieces over time, over the years. God knows there are a lot of them. But, you know, if I've learned anything since that July of 1998, it's that you don't answer questions like that. Yeah. No, I got it. I wanted to give it a try. <laughs> yeah. We just did a podcast, a great one with Barry Blitt. So I was rooting for Barry. And Barry Blitt, who is done in the last, certainly in my time, the lion's share of political covers, is a guy who presents on, certainly on a podcast or in conversation, a kind of arch- schlemiel like presence, but that's yeah. all facade. He yeah. is all steel and iron and wit. But that persona, he's really refined that. He's got it all going on there. <laughs> okay. Now, as long as we're talking about cartoons, it raises the question on the visual identity of the New Yorker. Yeah. Within magazines and then the, the larger culture as well, for some time now, thanks not exclusively, but very much to Apple and Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive, Design has been in the ascendancy, and designers in some cases in large consumer companies now demand to be and are included at the strategy table. It's not just a functional role. I've never heard you talk or I've never read anything you've written about design, and I'd love to hear how you think about that at The New Yorker. It's a good question. I, I think a something like The New Yorker, whether it's in the print age or now in a kind of multi-platform age print, digital, on your phone, on your screen, in the air, you know, projected against the Empire State Building, whatever it might be, needs to still be instantly recognizable. It need, you need to glance at it and know as quickly that it's the New Yorker as opposed to something else as you would on a football field and know it's the Giants as opposed to the Philadelphia Eagles. I think of the many things that we are happy to inherit, we have these signifiers we have Caslon typeface. We have Irvin typeface. Irvin typeface is the, the New Yorker. And then Caslon is the body type that's very distinctive. You see it from across the room and it's the New Yorker. If I were to put photographs on the cover of the New Yorker, I would just become like everybody else. Have I ever been tempted? Yes, but, but no, because that would be giving away the store. That would be the height of foolishness. Now, how does that then translate to other media? How does that translate to other media as art changes, as styles change, as the staff becomes different, more diverse, all the rest? Well, it does change. And people die and, and, and new talents come along. I just, I swear to God, George, a month ago, I had a speaking engagement and somebody asked me why we don't run any more Charles Adams drawings. She so loved Charles Adams when she was young. And I, I didn't want to be flip or dismissive or mean. But how do, how do you not be? Men's restraint. 
immense restraint. So what'd you say? But I, it's, it's nothing new to me. When I first started, I would get notes, how come you don't run Mr. Thurber anymore? Well, to quote Joseph Conrad, or to twist the quote, Mr. Thurber, he dead. <laughs> I remember Con. I never came across that Conrad quote. <laughs> Mr. Kurtz, he dead, yeah. But we know this, and it is true that the style of cartoons generically has changed. There are fewer fully lushly inked cartoons in the style of Arno or Adams or people who are wonderful. And and do I miss some of that? I do. I have to confess. I don't want to be old fashioned, but that kind of lushness and attention to style, as opposed to the more neo-primitive, st- whatever you want to call it, yeah. the people that are, you look at Roz or imitators of Roz. I think Roz Chess is a kind of genius. Oh my God, is she ever. Genius. I wait for her to post on Instagram. <laughs> I wait for her every week. So it's good that we have certain things that don't change or that they, if they change, it's because we're playing around with it like Eustace Tilly. But everything else is up for grabs. It drives me nuts to hear somebody refer to the New Yorker style, a New Yorker story. I just think that's lazy thinking. It's I think it's yeah. bullshit. It's like saying, okay, we published short stories by George Saunders and by Edna O'Brien. Are they the same? I think that's cr- crazy. Or a nonfiction, is Janet Malcolm the same as Evan Osnos or Hilton Owls or Vincent Cunningham? No. What I admire most about The New Yorker is that, yes, we pay attention to subject and we want to get to certain subjects over time. But most of all, we're publishing writers that readers want to read. They see the byline as quickly as they do the subject. And that's the appeal. I want to read what Carl Sagal has to say. I want to read what Rachel Aviv has to say, or Evan Osnos, or Julian Lucas, a wonderful young writer who joined the staff just a year or two ago. And yet, I have a slightly different reaction because of my distance from the New Yorker. But when I hear people say that, I think of it as a sign of kind of intense loyalty and passion for the publication in a way that when I think of the New Yorker, I think of Adam Gopnik, given my interests. I think of Elizabeth Colbert. But that's natural. It's because they've been around for a while. You know, Anthony Lane's been around for a good long while. So is Adam Gopnik or Hilton Owls and any number of other people. Calvin Tompkins is 96 years old and he's writing absolutely fresh and wonderful profiles of artists. Remarkable person. Uh, John McPhee, I'm editing this week, is, is 92. Roger Angel died only recently at 101 and was writing almost to the end. Yeah. But a magazine can't only exist on its elders, although we value them beyond measure. I I am constantly reading other places and other people to see what's happening. Who's new? What does this person have to say? And how does she say it? And quite frankly, also the diversity in the magazine is essential. When I got to the magazine, I came with Hilton Owls. And I guess Skip Gates also wrote periodically for The New Yorker, Jamaica Kincaid. I mean, it was really parlous. It was bad. I'm not saying we are anywhere near where we should be in, in certain ways. We don't have n- enough of this or that, but it, it, it's vastly different. Cartoon is the same thing. It's no longer you know, like the cast of the Friars Club, and that's important. You just talked about when you got to The New Yorker with Hilton. Let's go back and imagine um, it's maybe two years into your tenure there, and you show up, I don't know, at an ASME event or at the Columbia School of Journalism, and somebody's speaking, and they predict the 25 years into the future. The two leading magazine properties in the digital age would be what my buddy, the producer of this podcast, refers to as a designer as the eggheads, the Atlantic and the New Yorker. Can you imagine how the audience would have reacted? I don't know how they would have reacted. I I do know, and I'm very proud of my former colleague at the New Yorker and now the editor of the Atlantic, Jeff Goldberg. I think he's done a terrific job. But what I know best is the New Yorker, but I also know just as democracy is fragile, these institutions are fragile. I look at the New Republic and how great it was, complicated, much too male and too white and so on and so forth, but it really was an exciting institution and it got turned upside down and not for the better in an instant. I think it's finding its feet again now as a more left magazine and an interesting one, but these things are not forever necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, most of them are not. When my parents were middle-aged and young, Life magazine was at the center of their middle-class and middle-brow cultural existence. Life magazine. 
and to a lesser degree, Look Magazine and Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine. Life Magazine doesn't exist, neither does Look, neither does Newsweek really, and Time is on the bubble. And it's important to think about that for somebody in my position or the people that own the place or the CEO, Roger Lynch, who I think has done a stunning job of getting Condé Nast on its feet and finding a way toward the future. A stunning job, actually. Great part. But it's important to remember that. Everything is fragile. I want to come at this from a slightly different perspective. There's been lots of talk among those of us in media about the renaissance taking place in radio and television. Can you imagine a similar renaissance in print? Any idea where we might look for that type of renaissance to begin? I'm 64 years old. I grew up with print. I love print. And yet you're talking to somebody who does not any longer get a print subscription to the New York Times. I never would have thought that would happen even as recently as five years ago. But I read the New York Times no less intensely than I did all my life. I think a print New Yorker is a way better technology than a print New York Times because of the whole giant broadsheet problem. What I care most about with the New Yorker is what's in it, what's on it, what's said, how it's said, how it's edited, how it's written. If somebody chooses to consume it, to read it, to love it in print, in digital, in both, I'm happy. That's the most important thing. Long live print is dead. <laughs> you, you, you choose. The audience is going to choose that for us. What I want to do is make the best possible New Yorker and see the New Yorker thrive long past me. And I know my colleagues feel the same way. And it's an absolute privilege to serve that cause because that's what I think it is, cause. The New Yorker will be celebrating its 100th anniversary next year. For updates on their plans, visit the website at newyorker.com or follow them on Instagram at newyorkermag. If you'd like to connect more deeply with our guests, be sure to visit our website where we have complete transcripts of all our interviews, along with portfolios, archival photos, links, and other great information. Visit longliveprint.co slash interviews for more. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a member of the Hub and Spoke Audio Collective, a nonprofit association of audio storytellers dedicated to promoting and sustaining high quality independent podcasting, including the Peabody Award winning Rumble Strip, the number one podcast according to both The Atlantic and The New Yorker, who described it as a limitless podcast about life in Vermont. In each episode, host Erica Heilman invites herself into people's homes to find out what they know, hate, love, what they're afraid of, and what makes them more like you than you'd realize. These are the messy, obsessively crafted stories of the everyday. For more, visit rumblestripvermont.com or find it wherever you get your podcasts. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is made possible by support of listeners like you. If you'd like to contribute to keeping the podcast going, there are two easy ways. One, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co. Or if you're an optimist, longliveprint.co. Follow us on social media at printisdeadpod. Please give us a like and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks very much for listening.